All right, I can see the Zoom room filling up right now. Welcome everybody into today's virtual speaker session. We're gonna be getting started in just a couple minutes. Excited to talk with Jen Heasley today. If you are just joining us, go ahead and drop in the chat who you are and where you're Zooming in from today and your Penn State class year. A little bit of a different format today. We're gonna to be cooking in the kitchen with Jen Heasley. Welcome in everybody. We are gonna be getting started in just a couple minutes. If you could go ahead and drop in the chat who you are and where you're from. I see Megan Miller from the class of 2005, zooming in from Julian, Pennsylvania. Good to see you, Megan. And Ruth Ballman and Bruce is probably not too far away, class of 70 there in Chester County. We're not. We're gonna be getting started here in just a minute. Good to see some familiar names here on the Zoom today. All right, we see Don, Don Lukowski from Temecula, California, Don's class of 2020. Welcome in, Don. I see Deb Johnson from the Scranton campus, Lori B from Philadelphia, class of 75. Welcome in, everybody. We are gonna get started here in just one minute. I see Iona Conlon from the York campus down in York, Pennsylvania. Good to see you, Iona. And we are going to get started here. Good afternoon, Penn Staters, and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I wanna welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. This afternoon, we welcome Jen Heasley, the owner of the Game Day Kitchen Catering Company. She's going to share some fun and easy recipes that you can enjoy with your friends and family. Today's discussion is just the latest installment of a recurring series of virtual programming brought to you by the Penn State Alumni Association. And if you're interested in more of our programs that we offer, visit our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Now I'm happy to welcome Jen Heasley, who in addition to owning her own catering company, is a Penn State graduate, a television personality, and a cookbook author. Jen's food, Jen's food journey started at a young age, working in a restaurant by the age of 13. Uh, not considering culinary arts as an option early on, Jen pursued a degree in education from Penn State and as a teacher and coach for the York County School District, she would often host cooking events for her students, her athletes and their families. In 2016, Jen did some soul searching and with blessings from her daughters, Paige and Brooke, she retired from teaching to embark upon her culinary quest full time. She has been enjoying the experiences ever since and we are thrilled to have Jen joining us today to walk us through a few fun recipes for your tailgate. So, Jen, how are you today? I am well, Paul, how are you? I am fantastic. So excited about what we're going to do today. Uh, but first, talk about how you became a Penn State Nittany Lion. Well, it's, it's kind of a short slash long story, but not really that long. Um, I grew up in a household from, I have a uh, 
a pit mother and a Penn State father. Okay. So uh, the household was a high Penn State influence. Um, so when it came time for college applications and whatever, I obviously applied to a variety of places. And I really thought that I wanted to live in a city. And so I was like, maybe Pitt would be my first choice. That got shut down super quick, super quick. So uh, Penn State became like the, the ultimate choice. But, and that's how I became a Penn State. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, I touched on it a little bit earlier about how you started cooking from a young age. But uh, what, talk a little bit about, um, about how you really got interested in uh, the culinary arts and, and cooking and helping other people to do that. Well, I started cooking in a restaurant when I was like 13 years old. I was actually cooking. I was like uh, the dishwasher because there was literally no dishwasher. So I was the dishwasher. And then um, even when we were at Penn State, I worked at uh, what was T.C. Pepper's Fast Charlie's. I was a bartender there and I was a bartender at some of the places. And post-college when I was teaching, I was a bar or bartender slash I worked waitress and kitchen and a bar in Baltimore. So it was a kind of a long journey, not long, but just, you know, incremental because I enjoyed being in that kind of space. And then um, after I had my kids, I started hosting game day parties at my house. So that really kind of like was the evolution of my full cooking at home and just experimenting with recipes and just kind of branching out as far as the things that I wanted to cook. And the, the game day parties were probably the most paramount part of like my educational experience through cooking. Excellent. All right. So the first recipe we have, you're going to walk us through making a dip. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that. This is, a, this is a super, super easy one. Anyone can make this. And this is something, because a lot of times when I go out to get chicken wings, I'm that person that always wants extra celery, extra ranch. So it's a basic dip. It's a buffalo chicken um, dip. So Brooke, my daughter, can she's going to like zoom us in here a little bit. We're going to go down. Okay. All right. So basically in my bowl, I have some mayonnaise and sour cream. So it's one part mayonnaise to two parts sour cream. So one cup to two cups. And then I'm going to add in some, um, this is hot sauce. We use um, <laughs> Texas Pete. Yes. So this is Texas Pete. This is about mm, two tablespoons. And then I have some buttermilk and this is about two tablespoons of buttermilk. And I'm just gonna add in a packet of ranch dressing. And this is super quick, super easy. Now in the summer, a lot of times I make my own ranch dressing because of like the fresh dill and the fresh chives. But you know, obviously if you don't have that, you can utilize this pack very simply we're going to mix it up and not only we're going to add it to our um, vegetables but this can also be used as a salad dressing as well and you can put it on the side of your chicken wings too if you wanted to all right well i'm adding my ingredients here it seems like we might be working with different portion sizes here um we, we, might, know, be. <laughs> <laughs> we might be he's okay. like i have a, lo a lot good. of dip two tablespoons i think i'm working with a half a cup of hot sauce so uh, and that's, but that's the beauty of it, Paul. You can like elevate, you can um, change up the recipe. So if you wanted it a little bit spicier, add more hot sauce. If you want a little more of the tang, add a little more ranch dressing. So that's just the beauty. Like when you're cooking, it's not the same as baking. Baking is very unforgiving. Cooking is very forgiving. So you can make it your own. Let's get this all mixed up here. How's yours going? How's yours look, Paul? Mine, yours looks really white. Mine. Uh, has a today. Like it's pink. Oh, pink. Okay, that's that's what mine is, as well. So I'm I must be doing lighting. Something. It could be our light differential. That could be the issue. Could be our light. There we go. There we go. And so, what do you usually? What would you usually serve something like this with? Uh, right, so I know you said carrots, celery. Oh, yeah, okay. So yeah. I have the platter. No worries. No worries. Brooke, bring it down look for me then. Like All right, so like I said, so you would normally, obviously you have your carrots, your celery, your cucumbers, and then I added some romaine because a lot of times when you're at like a tailgate or a party, people enjoy having a salad to lighten up maybe the heavy foods that they're having. Right. So you throw in a little romaine or you could have iceberg, whatever, you know, lettuce you might have on hand. And it's just like a nice quick and easy dip or it becomes a salad dressing or it could become a dip for your wings. So you could, it's a multi-purpose, you know, dressing in my opinion. It could be used for sandwiches. And Brooke says it could be used for sandwiches as well. Uh, that's a good idea. Maybe we could put a little bit of that on the, the sliders that we have coming up in just you a could. minute. You could. 
or you could add sweet mama's mama sauce. <laughs> so that is the platter. So, you know, again, you could have a full salad platter. There we go. So a full platter like this with your veggies. And this would be kind of like when people come in, let me just adjust this back up. So when people come in initially, because oftentimes when you have parties, like you want to have a full spread, but maybe as people are coming in, you want to have, make sure that they have like an appetizer or something they can sample at the gate. And this is like a great, this is easy. Like this was super easy. Is it spicy? <laughs> no, it was super easy. I mean, I, I just put all the ingredients together here. I'm not sure if you could see. Um, I can't see yours, but I, I don't know if you can see mine. See mine offering there. So yeah, super easy um, and, a, and a great starter for sure for your tailgate. Flavor? What's that? Did you enjoy the flavor of the dip? I do enjoy the flavor. Mine is, mine is super spicy though. So I might've gotten some of the measurements wrong, uh, but totally, <laughs> totally my fault. Uh, okay. okay. You can come back. Add some more sour cream next time. You'll be fine. All right, so what's next on the menu today? So next we would, be, we would have, um, so I'm gonna hand this to Brooke. Um, so we would do uh, mustard wings, which is like a great way to fry wings. So a lot of times when people talk about, they, they go out for wings. Now this is not like a wing thing. This is a full fried wing. Um, okay. fry, Brooke. So it's a full fried wing. And the thing is, which makes this super easy, you marinate it literally, literally in mustard, and um, the seasoning that I love right here. So you use, you use yellow mustard and this, yeah, there we go. That's what's up all. And this is the seasoning that you use. So this is what you do. I like to marinate it overnight. And I know that you said that you live down in North Carolina and mustard is huge, right? Oh, right, right, the Western part. Right, th th yeah, so there's different elements of it. But um, as far as the state and the, how they do their barbecue. But a lot of times when they do chicken or they do ribs, they use mustard as a part of like the marinade. Right. And so that's all we're doing. So in a Ziploc bag, all I think you and I did, <laughs> was we took yellow mustard and we seasoned it with um, the Tony's seasoning. And again, this seasoning is like such, wait, let me it's a great all purpose seasoning. So we put it in the refrigerator overnight and you could do this quick, like this could be literally if you had to do it on the whim and did it, you know, within a matter of 20 minutes, it's still perfectly fine. Obviously better if you marinate it overnight. Right. Is that what, is that what you did, Paul? <laughs> I did. I, I have my Ziploc bag here and I marinated it overnight. Um, you didn't give me, I didn't have the measurements for the, uh, for the mustard. So I just put what I thought was uh, a healthy yeah, yeah. amount in there uh, to yes. my tasting and I might have put as long, a right as long as it's coated that's perfect paul you did the exact the purpose the perfect thing so you as long as it's coated and then you want to have a healthy amount of the seasoning but as long right. as it's coated and it's a, a little wet not overly wet a little coated then that's been you're perfect fantastic all right so do we have do you have some flour with you paul i do i do there, there we go so we have our flour and i know that i, I think that i sent you some measurements but if not this is definitely that's okay to kind of taste because you can actually taste the flour whenever, <laughs> you can taste the flour, it may not be normal, but you can taste the flour. So as far as we're gonna dredge it, and it's just a one, a simple one dredge. So we're gonna take the wings and put them into the flour. So sometimes if you do the other fried chicken, you might do um, flour, egg, flour, but this is just a one simple dredge. So we're not doing multiple things. So um, two cups of flour, and we're gonna add about a tablespoon of paprika, paprika. And then about a tablespoon <coughs> and a half of the garlic salt. Garlic salt there. Give the garlic salt, you good? I'm good. All right. I have, I have them all pre-measured. Oh, look at your, look at you measured out. I, good job, Paul. I was gonna do that, but I'm like, why? Cause I really don't normally do it. <laughs> and then, so we have the, um, then I have the onion powder. And because I buy everything in bulk, typically in my house, the Italian seasoning. So this is about a tablespoon of Italian seasoning. And 
and then the Tony. So the same um, seasoning that we use to marinate is the same that we're gonna put back in. Awesome. And here's the thing, Paul, if people did not have the other ingredients and if they just wanted to go with a one hit wonder, th they could use this completely. Like if they didn't wanna do the other spices for the flour on the day they're frying their chicken, they could simply use this. Like I'm doing like full promo for these people, but they could simply use this. <laughs> Oh, people love me. They could use this and be perfectly fine. But like, you really want to try and have all the flavors. And people may think this is a lot of um, seasoning, but it's not. Like, this is really what gives you the flavor that you want with your fried chicken. All right. So there we go. I'm going to toss this around. <coughs> so Tony's is the magic, the, the magic ingredient. If you can go without uh, anything, you wouldn't go, out, you wouldn't go without Tony's, right? My daughter knows I'm struggling because every time I use Tony's, I like start, uh, start sneezing, but I'm holding it in for everyone today. I'm, I'm keeping myself composed. All right. So you have it all in. And like I said, literally, Paul, like you could honestly taste the salt or taste the flour to make sure it's like to your flavor. If it's a little too, if it doesn't have enough seasoning, add a little more. If you want a little more paprika, if you want a little more garlic salt, then throw it in. All right. So the next step is you take your chicken out of the um, Ziploc bag. So we're gonna see if I can get down just a little bit tilt down. So you take it out. And this of course is what your wings are gonna look. They're a little soppy. And then we're gonna throw them into the flour. All right. And then you want to toss them around, Paul. You want to make sure they're completely coated. Right. Another one. And then so back up. Make sure it's completely coated. Like you really want to like kind of massage it in. Yes. And then yeah, massage it in and make sure like that inner part, because you know, you have the flats and the drums. Like when people talk about flats and drums and the whole controversy. This is, right. this is how you cut up a flattened drum, and then the little other part that gets cut. So shake it around, make sure it's mixed into all the parts of the chicken. All right, and then what I normally do for frying purposes is I let, I take the chicken out and I let it rest, or can you come down here a little further? Mm -hmm. Move this angle, there we go. So I actually let it rest on a baking sheet for about 10 minutes because I like to have the flour kind of locked in. There we go. The struggle people. Okay, here we go. So there you go. So we let it sit. All right. So this is what it would look like whenever Oh, I can't see yours. I hope other people can see yours. <laughs> are you, is it nice and coated? Is it all they, coated? They are nice. They are nice and coated. Perfect. They and are... sometimes people will add storm, uh, storm cards, cornstarch to give it a little crust, but I don't do that. I do that with um, like my hot chicken sandwich. But if you let this sit for about 10 minutes, it'll create a really, really nice crust. And then hand me the box that already preset. Have you done this uh, method before, Paul? I have not done this method before. Um, Are you my me my method in cooking wings is I call Quaker steak and lube, <laughs> and uh, and have them kind of whip up a batch for me, and we go pick it up about an hour later. So. Okay, that's actually one of my trivia questions for you, even though you don't have your board. So if you, outside of Quaker State and Lube, so if I had to give you some choices, if you had to pick from uh, Popeyes, Churches, KFC, who would be your go-to possibly for a fried chicken? Ooh, possibly for a fried chicken. So I'm, um, out yeah. of those, I would probably say Churches. Okay. Uh, churches, but the best fried chicken I have ever had in my life is a place called Pine State Biscuits. Uh, it's in uh, it's in northeast uh, the northeast neighborhood of Portland, and mm -hmm. it was a a transplant. We lived in Oregon for a number of years, and it was a North Carolina transplant who moved out to Oregon and started that. So we would go up there once a month and get some some great fried chicken and waffles. 
I would have to say Harold's Chicken Shack in Chicago would be the best fried chicken. I mean, outside of my own personal fried chicken. Like, let sure, me not sure. take myself down. Um, but Harold's Chicken Shack, one of my store wars, Sydney, we went there years ago, and that was the first time that I had Harold's Chicken Shack, and it was uh, fantastic. And it was delicious. So that would be the best fried chicken I personally ever had. All right. So do you have right. your um, oil? So I'm frying in cast iron. Are you frying in cast iron? I am frying in cast iron. I'm, yeah. I'm terrified right now. Don't so, be terrified. Um, Don't this, be terrified. Is where, this is where it all goes off the rails. It will not go off the rail. <laughs> it won't. So we have our pre-done our pre chicken. You put it in, Paul? Paul is yes. oh, going broke on me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the sizzle? Yes. Awesome. If you guys have questions for Jen, we are going to be asking her questions towards the end of our time here today. So go ahead and drop those into the Q&A section on the Zoom. So Jen, one of, your, one of the shows that you do uh, is, is a game day show. Uh, and, and so if people were to tune into that, what, uh, what could they expect to hear? Um, like the premise is like the, everything that we're doing here. Like I want to talk loud because my oil is right behind me. But the premise obviously is, so I've worked with a lot of great Penn Staters, as you know, and some other athletes. But the point is you really want people coming together over food. Um, for, that's like been such a paramount part of my life. So people right. coming into my home and we celebrate over games. But you want simple, easy recipes. And that's kind of the goal from the cookbook, from the website, from the blog from the people that I've done shows with, you really want things that are easy and relatively quick to prepare. Some things are a little more drawn out. It's also based on like the time that you have to invest, but I want to make sure people have options. And I think that's key. So, I mean, again, the cookbook, and over time, even from the cookbook, I've evolved. So it's a little more, I feel, I don't know, I'm not saying mature, but we've kind of like narrowed down our scope as far as we as a family, my daughters, myself, and my friends, it's like, okay, well, this one was a little easier than we thought. This one wasn't as easy as we thought. And right. so you can just kind of like redirect your focus or, you know, whatever it may or may not be, so. So how long do we let these fry for? Um, these fry for a while. So these fry for about um, six minutes per side. You want to make sure that they're completely, you know, obviously crusted and <laughs> golden brown. So if people were, if they wanted to fry them for a lesser window of time, what you could do is fry them and then put them in the oven for an additional maybe 10 minutes at 350 degrees to make sure they're completely, you know, crispy and crusty and people get the same texture. And they're still, they'll still maintain their moisture on the inside. I have a camera over my, over my stove here so people can see the, uh, how they're crisping up here. Um, I'm actually, I might be frying mine in a little bit of deeper oil, um, okay. so they're, they're fully coated, so I don't know if I'm going to, I don't have to. That's okay, them. if they're completely covered, see, I'm in, I'm, I'm at flat cast iron, if you're whatever, so if they're completely covered, they're fine, so it would still be the same one of time, but mine over here, so I want mine to fry the first side, so I know this crispy one, because when you move it around too much, it doesn't get the crispness that you may want, so you right. want to make sure that they have the time to fry and get that crispness and you know it's, it's okay like i said though if it doesn't have it when you come when you bring it out of your oil you can pat it dry season it with salt and then throw it back into the oven and you'll get the crispness that you want at 350 degrees it's okay, cool. <laughs> so i am i have my my homemade penn state plate here and I'm going to put them right on. I'm going to close the three. <laughs> no, no. I just feel like it's a it's fire in the fire. I think they are fine. So if you want to, so to make sure they're cooked through completely, then you will want to make sure that you put them in the oven because as far as the size of the wings, then put them in the oven for about, I would say maybe 10 minutes. And then that way they'll be completely cooked through and you won't have to worry about anything being undone. You never want a raw piece of chicken when your friends come over for a cookout or a barbecue. Yeah, that's a, that's bad form no, no, no. right there, right? That's a no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so what do we have next? Um, so the next thing we will be doing would be our pulled pork. I know that we are going to do the pulled chicken. We talked about doing pulled it from chicken. a grocery style. And we're going to do coleslaw to go along with it. So we're going to have that. All right, so I have, I have the Hawaiian rolls that you told me to go out and get. Perfect. And yeah. I have my pulled chicken as well. Okay. So do you want to walk through the slaw first? Yes, let's do that. Yeah. All right. So let's walk through the slaw first and then we'll talk about, I did the pulled pork, you did use the rotisserie chicken. And so we're just using a regular um, store-bought like pre-done coleslaw mix. And the ingredients that we're using are Miracle Whip, and not the other one. Miracle Whip, not mayonnaise, um, milk, sugar, vinegar, salt, and pepper. It's super easy. And if you want it to be a little bit spicier, you could add in some jalapenos or like some uh, cayenne pepper or some chipotle pepper to like okay. pick it up a ranch. Or, 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 Skip it, up, skip it up a notch. So I like to start the dressing itself with the vinegar. And we're also going to go down here. So there we go. So I like to start with the vinegar. And again, the measurements I know that we'll put up later. I know the recipes will be shared later. So I add the vinegar, and that's probably about two tablespoons. And then I add about two tablespoons of the sugar, white sugar, and this is white distilled vinegar. I add a little bit of the milk, and then I whip it. Of milk. You can call, all right, Paul. So I added my vinegar, I added my sugar, and I added milk. And I'll add a little bit more, because again, I like my, and acidic. So mine tends to be a little more on the side of the sugar and the vinegar. And it's again, this is white distilled vinegar, just regular white sugar, and just plain white milk. And now I'm going to add my salt and pepper. And I'm big on heavy on the pepper. Do you like pepper in your um? I pork do. Pork? I do like pepper. So I go heavy on the pepper. And I'll add some salt. Now often I like when I when I fry things, I finish with sea salt and I'm adding kosher salt to this one. But if you have both, you can go either way. It's really the both kind of versus out. But that's typically my go-to as far as salt is concerned. I'll go with some of the kosher salt that we have here. There you go. Good job. All right. All right. Now I'm going to add in my Miracle Whip. All right. Uh, okay. How much of that did you put in there? Oh, <laughs> the rest of the culture, I know, three fourths cup. So it also is based on. Do you like her this way? So it's also based on like if you like a, a wet slaw or a dry slaw. So if I personally like a wet slaw, but if you want something a little bit drier, first of all, you would cut back on the other liquids that I use. Right. Um, and the cut back on the Miracle Whip as well. And there's obviously so many variations you can do on coleslaw. Like I said, I put jalapenos in sometimes. Sometimes you can do it obviously without the Miracle Whip. You can just do a vinegar-based slaw, which is I think popular probably down, right, in Carolina. That's, yes. Um, so there's so many different variations on slaw that you can do. I mean, you can add mango, you can add all these other things, but this is my personal go-to. This, this actual bag that I use does not have red cabbage, but again, we're going for quick and easy things. So, we want to, you know, go with what's easy, but it's based on the bag that I find at the time, quite frankly. And this right. one is not a red salt or red cabbage, so that's what I want. But in summer, like growing up, my um, we had a garden, so we always had cabbage. We had red cabbage and green cabbage, so I grew up with both. But all right, so now I'm going to add the bag of slaw. Oh, this one has um, the marbles on it. 
<laughs> and you kind of gauge it again like if you want it less wet then add you know more slaw more wet add less slaw or less cabbage i should say or mixture so the one that i have has uh cabbage and carrots what does yours have you have the same so thing my, mine is carrots and cauliflower and broccoli and um some purple cabbage You've got a lot going on. <laughs> you have a whole a lot summer. Going on. Going on. All right. So we're going to flip our wings. As you toss this lot. Oh, the wings are looking great. Oh, this smells great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Smell that smell that vinegar. It's ramped up the oil there a little bit. And you know, people um the one thing as far as like checking temperature, I want to say that before before we put the uh chicken in. People often will like to use a thermometer to make sure it's like 350 degrees for the oil, but to make sure it's at the appropriate temperature. If you just throw, put a little bit of um, flour in and it sizzles, then you know it's the perfect temperature. Or you can drizzle a little water, but that obviously sparks it because of the moisture. You don't want that. You know, you know, if you're afraid of that, you don't want that. So a little flour, you get the sizzle that you want, and then you know that your oil is ready. But if not, make sure that you use a, temp or a thermometer to make sure you're at the correct temperature. So Jennifer, as you uh, as you come up on a game day, so first of all, let, let's talk about let's talk about a football season, right? Uh, Penn State football, you know, is is a passion for many people out there. Uh, some people plan their tailgates at the beginning of the season, so they have all of their ta their home tailgates planned out. How do you approach a football season from a food perspective? Um, when people contact me to cater something, I like to go with what the, the client is interested in. So if they say, okay, these are the things that perhaps our uh, clientele want to have, or, you know, we want maybe a vegetarian dish because um, the one person I consistently have catered for the last several years is Donald Blair, and they have this huge tailgate, and he is a pescatarian. So I always want to honor Donnie B's, you know, his pescatarian dishes. Some people are very poor, you know, strong on the pork, or some people are very strong on, they want maybe a brisket or whatever it may or not be. Some people love a sandwich platter. So I kind of go with the flow as far as what people are interested in having on their end. I also like to introduce maybe new recipes that I've come up with, like, oh my gosh, maybe we should try this this year. This is something new that I've done. So I think it's kind of like a two-way street. I've worked with so many people consistently over the years. So it's a dialogue. It's not like them telling me or me tell them they definitely are open to any new options I might have. And so it's a very, I guess, symbiotic kind of relationship that I have with most of the people I've worked with. That's, that's fantastic. So now as we move into uh, finishing off these sliders, we're, yes. we're gonna go in two different directions. I'm gonna go with the pulled chicken. Yes. And you're going with the uh, pulled pork. Yes, yes, I am, I am. So my sl our slaws are done. So I'm going to hand this, I'm going to this off. I'm going to move the slaw on a second. Yeah, whatever. So, so you got a rotisserie chicken, correct, Paul? I did. I did. I right. went to Wegmans last night. All right. So I hold on here. So we're gonna we're gonna move in here. So I did. I'm gonna pull this down. I did a pork butt, pork shoulder, uh -huh. in the crock. I know. I know. So I did pork butt, pork shoulder in the crock pot, and of course the Penn State crock pot. Okay, so as you can see, so what a lot of people may or not, you know, because I know you live down in North Carolina. So a pork butt is, you know, obviously it's pork butt, pork shoulder, picnic cut, however they want to call it, but there's a big fat cap that's on top of it. And you want to, whenever you put it into your crock pot, you want the fat cap on top because you want that uh, fat to melt down into your meat. So right. that's what I did. I actually cooked mine for 24, in the crock pot on low, 24 to 36 hours. I cover it with this basically chicken stock and I add again, back to my Tony's, add that okay. in and I let it, and I let it go for like 24, 36 hours. So is the difference between what you and I did, you went and did, you yeah, went oh, I, I went. I went to Wegmans, and there was a, a rotisserie bag, and we just pulled that out and put it in the cart, 
and paid for it. <laughs> exactly. So the difference is you were, you're able to take it home and you were able to shred it. Yeah. And then I would, you know, obviously pull this out. Exactly. You shredded it. <laughs> so you'll pull it out and, or I'll pull this out. I'm not going to pull the whole thing out because normally I'm going to pull this out. I'm going to take it out. But normally I would take, um, obviously the entire pork butt out into like a baking sheet and then I would shred it. I would obviously pull the fat cat back. And then put it, I often put it back into the crock pot, obviously, if I'm catering. And so I keep the juices that are in there because you want it moist because once it gets dry, it's not the same, obviously, texture. So I'm going to hold on. I'm going to pull out our wings real quick, okay? Okay. Because they're on the, so we can show everybody the final part of that before we continue to move on with our sliders. So Jennifer, you have uh, you've had the opportunity through the work that you do now to interact with a lot of uh, well-known Penn Staters, a lot of well-known Penn State football players, Blair Thomas, Terry yeah. Smith, Michael Robinson, Derek Williams. You mentioned before we came on here, Chaffee Fields. Talk a little bit about those about those interactions and uh, maybe some uh, stories from along the way and in interacting with those Penn Staters. Um. So. Gosh, just look, there's so many. Like, so when I <laughs> decided, no, so when I first decided to do um, the cooking show, Shafi was the person that, because he's an agent, obviously, for many, for some that don't know, he's an agent. And so I was able to be in contact with Shafi, and he, it, he put me in contact with Michael Robinson and Derek Williams. So they did my very first cooking show with me. I, we did like right here in my kitchen. Um, so I'm still obviously kind of close with those people. And then Shafi and I, over time, then I moved the show to a friend, another Penn State friend. He has this, you know, fantastic kitchen in Baltimore. And so we moved the show down there. So Shafi did a show with me. Um, Aaron Maven has done a show with me. Uh, as we know, Terry's still coaching. Terry and I were schooled together at the same time. I've catered for the football staff. So I've done lunch for the football staff as well. Um, Andre Collins, he works for the NFLPA. I um, catered, they, a couple years ago, they, they had like their like launch back for the, the football season. So I catered a whole tailgate kickoff for the NFLPA down there. Um, Tyoka Jackson, who, you know, he has IHOPs down in DC. Right. Uh, Keith Paganis, I've catered his uh, blue white parties. So, I mean, I've worked, yeah, I'm friends with people. I've worked for people. They've hired me to do different things. So I've had a, I'm very fortunate and blessed. Like, even in York, like Iona, York Penn State campus, I've right. catered with them and worked with them. Um, Harrisburg campus, Marissa Hoover, Don Friday, who's the head basketball coach, Danielle Lynch, who's head track coach. So, like, I've had, like, not just Penn State, Maine, but Penn State, you know, locally to me. So, I've been yeah. fortunate to do a lot of work across the board. So you've been able to maintain a lot of your Penn State connections now through some of the professional work that you've gotten into. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Penn State York. Talk a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur, right? Whether it's um, starting the catering company. I know you're into now the Mambo sauce, which we're going to talk a little bit about in, in just a couple minutes. <laughs> talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. So oh, um, when I went to Penn State, obviously I went to Penn State, um, I graduated with an elementary degree, a degree and a minor in science. So when I student taught, I student taught in York because I wanted to do urban education. So then I got hired immediately after that. And so my entire tenure was in York. So when I made the decision, like I said, I started doing, let me back up. So I would do these programs at the middle school that I taught, where I taught science. And that evolved into me actually doing a cooking show with the students. So it was called Hannah Penn's Cooking. The kids would literally come here to my house. We would cook and they would edit it and do the entire program. But I realized over time, and like Brooke could tell you, like the kids didn't want to be on camera. So I was like, oh my gosh, let me, let me jump on camera. So it was like, it wasn't because I wanted, it was almost out of necessity that the kids, because they wouldn't talk on camera. So that's how the show evolved. I was like, you know, what? I really want to do a cooking show with professional athletes because game day food is so big. Like this is such a term, like this is huge in our country. So that's how that kind of evolved in, into that space. So then the cooking show went into a blog. The blog went into a cookbook. The cookbook went to me saying, you know what, as much as I love teaching and I love my students, this is really where I feel like I wanna take my life because 
with cooking, I can still impact kids, right? I can right. still do classes. I can still do other things in regards to cooking. So I went from this to this to this. So I retired in like 2016. How the page was what? Um, was she a sophomore? Yes. Page was a sophomore for whatever. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. <laughs> I'm glad she can fill in blanks for me. So like <laughs> the girls were cool with it. Like the girls like, you know, mom, do your thing. So we, you know, I retired and I started, obviously, initially I thought there was just going to be catering. Right. And, you know, I, I, my focal point was catering. I was going to do catering, game day catering, and it was just going to be this magical, amazing, whatever. And it just, it didn't, you know, and I had some people that definitely uh, mentored me and kind of tried to help me along the way. But as I was catering, the sauce became the thing. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, this sauce is fantastic. And I was just taking it along, like as a side for wings or as a side for pulled pork or pulled chicken. And then people suggested, you know, you should really try and bottle this. So I hired a woman that helped me as a food consultant as far as bottling and all those things. And then we went from there. That's amazing. So, okay, we have our slaw. You yes. have your pork. I have my chicken. We have our I rolls. The wings right. Paul. I oh my the gosh, wings. look at those. Yes, the wings are done. And you should so, hit these off with a little salt when you're done also, just so you know, because that's the one thing people don't do. When you fry something, not that I suggest frying every day like we do, but when you fry <laughs> something, you should, it's not healthy, but you should hit it with a little salt because you want it to lock in, lock that flavor in. So yes, I'm ready for this, the sliders. So someone's asking a question about the recipe that we are, that we are using here. Um, we talked about putting it into the, um, into the stove. We talked about frying it. Uh, someone's asking if they could put it on the grill. Would this recipe work if they just threw it on the grill? Not the wings, no. Not with the, if you want to just grill them uh, with just a, a regular olive oil and the Tonys, let me go back to the Tonys, you right. could grill them like that. You would never put the flour on the grill. Like if you just had a basic um, naked wing, that's fine, right. but you would never put the flour on the grill. That's no, that's no. But if you took them, if you took them out of the, out of the refrigerator in that oh, marinade yeah, and put them right on the grill, that would be perfect, right? That's perfectly fine. Yes, yeah. so especially with the mustard, because absolutely the mustard on um, chicken or ribs, mustard on ribs, fantastic, fantastic. So yeah, that's perfectly like doable. Yes. Okay. All, All right. right so let's put it together. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move aside my hold on here. We brought this over. So like I said, I'm going to show people the pork fat. We're going back down this way. Now bring the bowl over. So if I was doing it independent, like for a larger group, I would have pulled it out and put it onto like a baking sheet. So I would shred oh, it up. So I'm just going to pull a little bit out, right? Pull this back. Oh, that's amazing. Look at that. Yeah. And you, when Danielle, it, when you, I'm sorry, go Danielle go Drakeford, on. Danielle Drakeford's asking the best way to shred the rotisserie chicken. I did it uh, essentially like, um, like Jen is doing it right now where you take two forks and you just, you just start to, to shred across uh, and, mm -hmm. it and it broke up really nicely for me. Yeah. The forks are the, the best, the easiest way to go in my opinion. I mean, there's all these tools out there, but if you just pull it out, just shred it up. You're good to go. And the other thing falling apart oh, there, though. when people keep, when it, people do it in the crock pot for an extended period of time, they want to make sure that they keep it covered with the liquid. Cause if you don't keep it covered, like just check on it. And I also like to add um, some saran wrap. I'll cover my actual pot with some saran wrap and then put the lid on. All right. Okay, so this is the shredded the shredded pork. I'm gonna put it. Oh man! I know that you have the Hawaiian rolls, and I I have potato rolls. So I'm gonna put this on. Uh, what flavor of sauce did I send you? I have the. It looks like it might be the original. Is it the plain lips? Yes, the plain lips. <laughs> it's the plain lips. Okay, yes. Yeah, so you have the original. All right. So yep, that's the plain lips, exactly. So you have the original. All right. So here is here are my two with the okay. pork on. You're gonna go original. I'm gonna go spicy, which is my favorite, but um the Raging Islands, so this is the spicy. So when people look at the bottles, when you read the lips, because that's my thing, read the read my lips. So mine is the spicy. And then the Raging Island, which is pineapple habanero, 
is actually, oh, wow. the, yeah, this is the most popular seller. I have a Maryland style, which is Old Bay and Natty Bow. Um, I have a mango, which is mango and chipotle. And then I have seasonal ones. I have a peach and bourbon, and then I have a, a cranberry and cayenne. That is so. fantastic. So, uh, Jen, a question from your friend, Shelly Hollingsworth. Uh, oh. Do you have other aspirations in regards to cooking? Maybe a cookbooks, more sauce? What's yes, next? So, well, actually, the next thing that I'm actually going to work on, another cookbook. We want other cookbooks. But um, the other thing is I'm going to work on a, a rub. So I learned recently from a friend that I can dehydrate liquids to another, I didn't know that, but like dehydrate and then actually create, I'm going to make the sauce into hopefully a rub and then I'll add it on to uh, meats or whatever it may or may not be. But I can use it also for like chips or popcorn or something. So just like a dry, you know, rub in general. So that's, that's the next goal. And we do want to, the goal, there is some goals for restaurants. That's a little further down the road, but we would definitely like a college theme cookbook my daughter, the one that's at Penn State, we did some TikToks this summer as far as college cooking. Uh, right. I really thought TikToks were just for dancing, but I learned that they were not just for dancing. So. <laughs> but you that's, know, this, so that's my goal. This kind of food seems like it might be perfect for a food truck. Have you thought about that? Um, I just, just because I've done this, like, I mean, four, four years is not a long time, but in four right, years, I've right. done a lot. Let me just put it that way. The food truck life is not necessarily something I personally would want. Right. Um, I think sticking to a restaurant style, tailgate, you know, catering, that, that's definitely more me from that, you know, angle. But I understand why people think it's a food truck, but it's just not a food truck. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I put mine together here. Oh, let me see yours. Yours look, oh, yours look good. Let me add, look, I'm good. Let me add my slaw. Paul's ahead of me, everyone. <laughs> And then, you know, I also will top mine with some jalapenos. Not to outdo you, Paul, but I'm gonna add some jalapenos. No, no, that's, a, that's okay. You like to bring the spice. I like the spice, we're gonna add some jalapenos. So, or you could add pickles, obviously. You could add some pickles to it as well. So, here are mine. Oh man, they look, that looks fantastic. So we have one more item to get to, right? Oh, what, what? Yes. I'm gonna pass, yeah, so we're, so we're gonna do a apple pie dessert nacho. Okay. Are you ready for that, Paul? I, I am absolutely ready for that. I fried up my tortillas last night, Good so job. they are all ready to go. Good job. I did as well, Paul, so we're safe. We're not frying. <laughs> we're not going to fry. Yeah, no one. more frying. <laughs> no more frying. <laughs> all right, so we have, we have a huge tray. So, so again, so it's apple pie. So we have this basically, I used some Fuji because I like an apple that is a little sweet and tart. You could use a Granny Smith, you could use a Honeycrisp, but this is the ones that I use. Now, if you were serving this, you know, if you were for some reason using an apple for display, you would add a little lemon juice so that it would be obviously not turn brown. But in this sense, we used this Fuji and we did not add any lemon juice to it. So I'm gonna turn my um, pot on and we have some butter. And we're going to season it with cinnamon, some clove, and nutmeg. So anything when you think about like an apple pie, the flavors that you get from an apple pie, that's what we're going to put into with the apples. And then our topping sauce is going to be a caramel cinnamon topping sauce. So, and I did about two apples, Paul. So I'm going to add to the skillet. I, I, did, I did about eight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, think we, I think we swapped recipes. I think... You did the ones that I was supposed to do. <laughs> I know, I, again, Paul, sometimes it's all about you know, being, being relative, so. All right, so the butter, did you melt? So mine's about, let's see, I'm gonna add about two tablespoons butter. Okay. Same here. You got the same? Okay, good, thank, thank God for that one. Um, <laughs> all right, so then, and then honestly, like we have the recipe, but you can just sprinkle on. The one thing that you do not ever want to be heavy with is the clove because clove okay. is like super, super strong. So I just do a little dash of the clove and then the nutmeg and the cinnamon. Okay. 
And then the thing that we'll do next as this heats up is we'll create a slurry, which is the cornstarch in the water. So the same way like people will make a, a gravy, how they thicken it up is through a slurry, which is um, one part water, one part cornstarch. Okay. And when you season the apples, it's also, again, it's really all about taste. And then I'll add sugar. So I am kind of heavy on the sugar. <coughs> so the sugar will probably, the sugar is probably about a half cup of sugar to three fourths cup. It's pretty, it's heavy on the sugar. All right, I got that all mixed up right here. You're mixing, okay. Yeah, we're not at the slurry yet, are we? Have we done that? We're not at the slurry, we're not at the slurry. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move this aside, move this aside. All right, so there we go. So do you have them in your skillet, Paul? I have my apples frying in my skillet. And let's see. You can just let it cook down. As long as it's like on a medium to medium low heat, they're fine. We'll add the, the slurry in and it, it'll cook independently. It's not something that you have to kind of hover over. It's a very easy, simple cook. All right. How long do you let the apples cook for? You want them to be tender. Like you don't want them, I mean, if you cook them too long, they can almost become like um, an applesauce consistency, which is not what you, I mean, you might, that, you might want that. Um, I like mine to have a little bit of a bite to that. So if you want a little bit of a texture, a little bit of a bite, you can, you know, cook them a little bit of a shorter period of time. If you want them a little softer, then, you know, cook them probably maybe more of like the 20, 30 minutes. I think typically I go um, 10 to 15 minutes. Excellent. Excellent. All right, you ready to move on to the slurry? Let's do it. Okay, <laughs> so we're gonna add, like I said, you wanna kinda go one part water to one part cornstarch. And sometimes people, I mean, I would not recommend flour for this, but oftentimes people will use flour um, when they're doing a gravy of some nature. But in this situation, I would definitely say go cornstarch. If you were doing like Asian cuisine, if you were doing like a chicken and broccoli, that's, this is how people get the, thick, the thickening agent as far as like the sauce is concerned. And so Jen, uh, yes. we, are, we are coming up on our time here and um, I, I want to continue to do this. We can go over if we need to, uh, but people are wondering how they could get your products or how they can get more information about you. Where can they find that information? Okay, so you can order the sauce. The sauce is sweetmamasmambosauce.com. Literally, sweetmamasmambosauce.com. Um, my uh, blog website, my recipes are on cookingwiththepros.us. And you can always find me on Facebook, which is just Jen Heese's Cooking with the Pros. On Instagram, I'm under Cooking with the Pros, so you can find me either way. If you just type my name in, I'm there. Excellent, excellent. All right, I got my slurry. All right. uh, where do I, what do I do with that now? Honestly, Paul, just it, literally you can just throw it in. Throw it into, into the apples with all the other stuff, with the sugar. Just throw it into the apples. Okay. And put it down to like a medium, medium low and you can just let it go. Do we have time to do the topping and all that? Uh, yes, let's do it. Well, we, can't, we can't stop now. We can't, you're right, we can't stop now. <laughs> because um, we can't. All right, so as far as the topping, I'll go ahead with the topping, Paul, while you work on that, okay? All right, go for it. Awesome. So the topping is just basically a cool whip, like a whip topping. So we're going to put in, and this is super easy because it's a caramel whip topping. So we're going to throw this in. And this is about half of the large container. And then you're just going to get a caramel um, sundae topping and mix it in. 
a lot of times I use my my mixer, but we don't have to do that today. Mix that in, and then we're going to add in some ground cinnamon. Oh, you grab the apples in a second. All right, so we're just going to mix. You're going to kind of fold it in like this. And again, this is to taste, Paul. I know like, I'm all over the place here. It's getting on my hands. <laughs> my mess right now. This is so easy. Like we let this come to room temperature, obviously, right? So you buy it frozen, you let it come to room temperature, mix it in. I'm gonna add a little more of the caramel. Uh, thanks, Brooke's gonna name me a towel. Thank you, my sous chef. Thank you. I care. She cares, she says. <laughs> mix it in. All right, so grab me. So we have some pre-done tortillas. We have the apples that we cooked this morning. And we'll show people how to um, assemble it real quick here. Cleaning as you go is key, Paul. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I don't live by that, but for those who don't like dishes like myself, I recommend it. That's my recommendation. Okay, so we have, let me clear this off a little bit, get some space. So here are the tortillas. So we fried flour tortillas which we cut into, let me put this up here, yes. Oh, beautiful, there we go, Paul. So we cut the flour tortillas. This is what the flour tortillas look like, right? We cut them up, right. and then we season them with sugar, um, cinnamon sugar, sugar, cinnamon sugar. So here we have the tortillas, and then the apples that I did earlier this morning, and then you just top them independently. And if you wanted them, this, this is obviously room temperature right now, if you want it as a warm dessert, you just break it out right after you cook them. A little on each. You could do a whole platter. There we go. I am just gonna drop them all over. There we go, just like that. Right, exactly, you do, oh, there we go, I like it, it's okay. A full nacho plate. And then, all right. This is what I'm gonna do, Paul. I'm gonna do a little dollop of the um, caramel cinnamon topping like this. Oh, it smells like Thanksgiving good. in my house right now. Exactly, that's the goal, it's apple pie. <laughs> I know we're in August, but you know, it's okay. Smells very good. <laughs> Brooke says it smells good here as well. <laughs> we'll, we'll attend to that, hold on one second. <laughs> We don't want to burn our current apples. That would not be good. All right. And then I top it off just for aesthetic value. A little cinnamon to make it pretty. All right. So this is, this is my final. These are my final ones. Um, you yours look a lot better than mine. It's okay. Paul, I've been doing it for a minute. We're good. <laughs> you're, you're good. You're good. I know. My measurements have been a little reckless for you now. <laughs> So this is my final result on the apple pie dessert nachos. That is fantastic. So Deborah Johnson's asking, do you bake your tortillas or do you fry them? I know, I know the answer. You know, I, 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 know, I, know, I know how I did. I know how you did it, but I, yeah. could you, could you bake them for a healthier version? Yes, you could. So you could cut them and you could actually spray them with like a cooking spray or brush them with honey. So you could spray them with a cooking spray or brush them with honey and mm -hmm bake them when you bring them back out you could again brush them with the honey or spray them and then sprinkle on the cinnamon sugar but you don't have to fry them i said just frying them but you're not <laughs> that is fantastic well jen we're out of time today again go ahead to tell people about your website and how they can get more information about you or they can pick up their favorite flavor of mambo sauce for themselves yes absolutely so you can go to um, sweetmamasmambosauce.com. It's literally sweetmamasmambosauce.com. It's the full thing. Um, for recipes, you can go to cookingwiththepros.us. My Instagram is cookingwiththepros as well. And honestly, you can always just inbox me on Facebook and I will answer any recipe questions that you may or may not have or go through carry or whatever. I always answer people's questions and I love to. So, Well, Jen, I can't wait to dig into what we've made here today. Thank you so much for sharing your talent and your skills with us and with fellow Penn Staters. And thank you all for joining us today on the virtual speaker session. As a reminder, we'll be hosting 
more sessions throughout the coming weeks. You can find all of that information on the Alumni Association's website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you again. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank